Look it up. Romans 8 and 10. If Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, any time I've usually read that and heard that preached years ago, people were always telling me that hasn't happened yet, that that's going to be when Jesus comes. How many know Jesus is coming back? And how many know the dead are going to be raised? We read those scriptures at every funeral. The dead shall be raised incorruptible. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up and so forth. And they say, well, that's talking about when Jesus comes back, he's going to raise our bodies. And then I realized that's not talking about that. That is going to happen. And 1 Corinthians 15 is talking about not this verse, though. And the reason I know it's talking about now, because when we read it together with the next two verses, look what it says. So let's read verse 11, 12, and 13 again. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, how many have God's spirit dwelling in you? Then he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your bodies, your mortal bodies, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we're debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. So why would it say I don't have to live after the flesh because God's going to quicken my mortal body? If quickening our mortal bodies is talking about when Jesus comes, and it hasn't even happened yet, how am I going to stop living after the flesh now because of something that hasn't even happened yet? See, that's saying that right now, God's Spirit can give life to my body so I don't have to live after the flesh anymore. I don't have to mess up and make mistakes and like Paul said in Romans 7 and somewhere around 21, when I would do good, evil's always present with me. That's living after the flesh. That, when you try to do good and evil's present with you, that's like saying, I'm going to be nice to people. I'm going to be nice to people. And then the next person that comes, you can't help it. You get right mad at them. And you put them right down. That's trying to be good, but evil being present with you instead. And that's living after the flesh. And Paul said, you don't have to have that struggle. The Holy Spirit can quicken your mortal bodies, make you alive so you are not a debtor to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall what? Die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. In other words, these are the deeds of the body when we strike back at people and when we lie and when we say mean things and when we tell people off and hurt them, when we just lose it. So it said in verse 3 to 13 that if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. So why would it say in verse 13, the Spirit can mortify the deeds of your body after verse 11 says, the Spirit will quicken your mortal body. And you don't have to live after the flesh. If quickening our mortal bodies wasn't talking about giving you power over these weaknesses, giving you power over these struggles, it can give you life <clears throat> and it can quicken and destroy everything that is not right inside you. You know what we need to do this year? We need to learn how to see that happen. We need to learn how to have our spirit quicken, uh, the Holy Spirit quicken our mortal bodies so that it kills the deeds of the flesh. It mortifies them. These things that hurt other people, these lusts that we have, um, even looking at ourselves and hating ourselves and all that type of thing, that stuff needs to be killed. Because if, it does, if we don't kill it, it's killing us. That's why it says in verse 13, if you live after the flesh, what shall you do? you'll die. And so, I'm going to go to Romans 7, the next scripture she can get on the screen, Romans 7, verse 9 to 15. And then after it says, if you mortify the deeds of the body through the, everybody say, through the Spirit. You will live. Then it says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, 
They are the sons of God. Now, how many know if you're being led by the Spirit, if it's leading you, whoever's leading you, you're following them. You're walking after them if they're leading you. When they have a parade and somebody at the head of the parade, they used to, I don't know if they still do it anymore, they used to have this one man with a baton and he'd be marching and leading that. They would all follow him. So if we're led by the Spirit, then that means we're following the Spirit. We're walking after the Spirit. And here, after it tells you, the Holy Spirit will quicken you and it'll mortify those deeds of the body so you can live. Then it says, because as many people as are led by the Spirit of God, they're the sons of God. That when you are led by the Spirit, that means the Spirit is killing things in your life. The Spirit is defeating those weaknesses. The Spirit is killing the cussing for you that you speak when you get angry. And, or the lust, the adultery, the lies. Some people have a problem with lying. When the Spirit's killing those things, because you're allowing Him, you're walking out, you're being led by the Spirit. Now, when I always heard of people preach about being led by the Spirit, they were always saying things like, well, um, God spoke to me. I was letting the Spirit lead me, and He spoke to me about you, and, and God has this word for you, and that is Spirit leading. And, or somebody being led by the Spirit, somebody in here needs healing, and they pray for you to get healing, and that's the Spirit leader. That is true, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. You, when you read about being led by the Spirit in verse 14, you have to go back to verse 11, 12, and 13. Find out what he's saying about the Spirit because that's the leading of the Spirit he's talking about. And how many would like to be led by the Spirit to mortify the deeds of your body, to, to kill out these weaknesses, these doubts, these struggles that we have? The Holy Spirit is quickening us so much that we're overcoming our weaknesses. They are the sons of God. And we, I remember talking about this a couple of years ago. And some of you remember. That word sons is huios in the Greek. And it's not just kids. It's adults. It's mature children. So you're a mature Christian when the spirit can start killing these things in your life instead of those things killing you. Praise God. How many like to have that kind of victory in 2015? If we can grab a hold of that revelation, a real mature child of God is somebody that the Spirit is killing these things. They used to have a problem with doubt. Now the Spirit's just killed that. And it's not killing them anymore. They killed it by the Spirit. Then this year could be awesome for us. Spirit, like we're getting something out of this. Our lives are actually changing. And, you know, people have the idea, and a lot of Christians even have it. Well, I was brought up this way, and my parents did this to me, and they said these mean things, and now I'm the way I am, and I'll never, you got to learn to live with it. No, the Holy Ghost can change that. But I get a hold of God, and God can change. And any of those weaknesses, he gets rid of that. I don't need to go back and deal with my past. My past was dealt with when I got baptized into Jesus' death. That all died. And then God gave me his righteousness. And then the best thing about it was I learned about that. I learned I was righteous when Jesus saved me. And now I'm not hung up on not being good enough. That doesn't bother me. That doesn't even enter. Well, I'm not good enough. That doesn't bother me because I've got his goodness. Praise God. And so when you walk by faith, you are being led by the Spirit to kill these things in your life. And that's why it says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage in verse 15. How many know some Christians have bondage in their life? They're not free. They're, they're tormented. They have nightmares. You know, you shouldn't be having nightmares. If you're having nightmares, there's something wrong. The enemy's working. You need to overcome that. You need to pray in the name of Jesus. I rebuke every spirit that would torment me tonight while I sleep. I'm going to have a peaceful sleep. Satan, get out of my room. Spirits, get out of my house. This is not of God. I'm a king. I'm a priest. And by the spirit of God, I'm killing this now. And then by faith, lay your head down and go to sleep. And that... Is you're, you're, you're becoming a king. You're taking over. You're, you're not letting things push you around. You're pushing the devil around now. How many would like to start pushing the devil around instead of having him push us around? 
Well, we're kings and priests. We can do that. And the only reason we don't is we either don't know about it or we do know about it and we're not living like it's true. That's why I said if we could live because of what that word says and we haven't seen any visible evidence that it's true. It's just that God told us and we trust it so much we're going to actually act like that now then we are being led by the Spirit of God. We are mature. Somebody say that's walking in faith. Whatever you're walking after is what's leading you. So walking after the Spirit means the Spirit is leading you. And they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the mature adult sons of God. And so last week, I taught about this. I got into this on the internet. That when... You see the Spirit work in your life, like verse 11 says. It's quickening your mortal body. You don't have to live after the flesh anymore. You are being led by the Spirit. That's what I homed in on last Sunday. And he says, if you walk after the flesh, what did he say you will do? Die. die. What did he mean by dying? You shall die. Go to chapter 7, verse 9. And I'll show you what he means by that. See, this is chapter 8. We've got to go back and see what he meant by dying. For I was alive without the law once. This is Paul because he was a Jew. The Jews lived under the Ten Commandments. He said, before the law ever came, I was alive. But when the commandment came and it said, thou shalt not this and thou shalt not that, all of a sudden Paul said, sin revived. And he died. He said, I died. Now, he didn't physically die, right? He wouldn't have been writing Romans if he died physically. But when it said he died, it meant that something rose up in him called sin. And when God said, thou shalt not lie, it's like something in him wanted to lie. And when the Bible says, thou shalt not commit adultery, covet thy neighbor's wife, he said, it's like sin stirred up inside me. It, it came a lot. And he called it killing him. I died. Like, I was thinking all these wrong things. How many know what I'm talking about when we were kids? Parents says, don't do that. And for some reason, you want to do it. Now, I would never have wanted to do it if you didn't say, don't do it. But now I want to. <laughs> That's like the one thing God told Adam and Eve. I mean, God didn't give Adam and Eve Ten Commandments. He didn't give them 613 that Moses gave the, the Israel. He gave them one commandment. Don't go to the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And, and what's the very thing they want to do? With the devil's help, they wanted to do that. It's like when the commandment comes, all of a sudden we want to do this now. And so... That's what he meant by dying. So that's why when chapter 8 says, if you live after the flesh, you shall die, that's saying that if you live after the flesh, all these things are going to rise up in you when you want to do what's right. You want to serve God. The commandment says thou shalt not, and you want to stop what it says stop doing. But something else called sin rises up and makes you do it anyway. He said that's what it means to die. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taking occasion by the commandment, deceived me and by it slew me. So here he says, I died in verse 9. It was death in verse 10. 10 rather. It slew me in verse 11. That's the dying that chapter 8 is talking about. If you live after the flesh, you're going to die. You're going to blow it. You can tell if you're living after the flesh as a Christian. You, you, can't, you lose your temper. Or you get scared all the time at things. You get stressed out. Or you lie and, and you do nasty. When somebody says something nasty to you, you say it right back. Then you know you're not a mature child of God. Then you know you're not uh, walking after the Spirit. So all of us have different things we battle with. What your struggle is might not be what my struggle is. But whatever our struggles is, we've got to overcome them. And it's going to be by walking after the Spirit and becoming a strong, mature child of God. Praise God. So verse 12 said, Wherefore the law is holy, the commandment is holy. There's nothing wrong with God saying, Thou shalt not. It wasn't the law that was wrong. It's me that's wrong. There's sin in me. 
He says, was that then which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin that it might appear sin, that's the problem. It was working what in me by that which is good? Everybody say death. And uh, now let's go to Hebrews 11 and 1. How many believe you died with Jesus when he died on the cross? You know what we, what we kind of had wrong for a long time? Jesus died for me. You know, it's not really, he did in one sense, but it's, it's more correct to say he died with me or I died with him. If I go to the bank for you, you didn't go to the bank, right? I went. So if we died with Jesus, then it's not enough to say that he died for us. He died with us. We died with him. God actually sees that we died when Jesus died. That's how we got saved. How many believe that's the word? Right? But did you see that? Did somebody show you? Here's a video of you. You see the time? See you up there in the cross right with Jesus? You're on the same cross as Jesus. If you look carefully, behind his head you can see yours. Here's the picture to prove it. No one ever showed us that. But we believe it because the word says it. In fact, we believed it so much, we became Christians. We started going to church services on Sunday. We changed the whole way we lived. We stopped going to certain places we used to go to. We stopped being around certain kind of people. We stopped talking certain ways and living certain... That's how much we believed that. So you know what? We had faith. And how many know faith? That's how we get saved. By grace through faith. And Roman, Hebrews 11 and 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things what? Not seen. Not seen. <clears throat> you cannot see it, but you believe it has substance. And you believe it's as real as the ground that you're standing on. And everyone in this chapter of Hebrews, chapter 11, everybody say Hebrews 11. <laughs> that is the roll call of the heroes of faith. Everyone that you read about, if you look at it carefully, they did something with their lives based on something they were told and never even saw. That's faith. Just like you changed the way you live by something you never even saw. That was faith. Well, these people, every one of them. So look at, now we're going to read down at verse 7. By faith, Noah, being warned of God of things, what? Not seen, not seen as yet. See what it's taught. Verse 1 says the evidence of things not seen. Now, Noah, something he never even saw. He was warned of something God never even showed him. It's going to rain, Noah. Noah said, well, I'll believe it when I see it. Well, if he would have done that, he would have drowned with the rest of them. <laughs> But he believed it so strongly without seeing one bit of proof that he moved with fear and prepared an ark for the saving of his house. Like he built a whole ark and it took a year to do it. No, it actually took 100 years, didn't it? 120 years. Didn't take a year. I mean, how many know if you're going to spend 100, over 100 years building a boat over something that you never even seen proof is going to happen? You got faith. <laughs> I mean, you're just going by God's word. And it says, by which he condemned the world. He became the heir of righteousness, which is by faith. And look at this in verse 8. By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should afterward receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went. God didn't say, okay, here's some pictures. Here's some tourist pictures of the promised land. This is yours. And, and not only that, Here's the ownership papers. You're going to inherit this when you get there. Here, it's yours. He never saw anything. He never saw a mortgage paper. He never talked to any landowners. He was just said, told by God, I'm going to give you this land. He believed it so much that he moved away from his whole city. What would I've moved around the whole country. I went to California. I went to Texas. I went to Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, New Brunswick. Now we're in Manitoba. I've moved around, but before I went, I went and looked and found some houses and made sure I had a place to stay. Abraham didn't do any of that. 
Can you imagine? I wonder what my wife would think if I said we're going to Honolulu tomorrow. Well, she might like that. She probably wouldn't mind that. That's not too hard. To <laughs> but we're going to stay there for the next 20 so years. And we don't have a house. We never saw the place before. Or we Just say Honolulu. You never even heard of it. Never even knew where it was. That's what Abraham thought like when he went and done what he did. Every one of these people, if you read it carefully, they did something with their whole lives based on something they never even saw. In verse 9, by faith he sojourned in the land of promise. It was one thing for him to leave where he was, but it was another thing that once he got there, he lived there like in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles or tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise, because he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. In other words, he was so strong, he, didn't, he, he, he said, Isaac, son, and when your son comes along, we're not building anything. We're not building, we're staying in tents. Why? God's going to make us a city. Well, did he show you the plans? No. Well, did he show you at least where it's going to be? No. Well, why are we spending our whole life in a tent for? Johnny and Mary's dad, they live in a house. We're living in tents? That's right. Because God told me where he's building us a city. And when he died, he never even saw the city yet. <laughs> he died not having seen the promise. I mean, to live until you die and you're still believing? Because how many know there's life after death? Abraham's going to see that city. <laughs> Praise God. But look how much he changed his whole lifestyle based on a mere word from God. And that's all. And then verse 11, through faith also. It's not just Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even his wife Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. God promised me I'm going to have a son. Well, look at your body. You're too old. <laughs> I see my body. I know how old I am better than you do. It's my body. You don't think I know that? But I don't care what I see. I believe what he said. And here she had a baby. I mean, the doctors could have showed her if they had the technology. Here's the x-rays. Here's, here's your age. And here's some samples of your blood. And here's why you just can't have any kids. You're too old, Sarah. I don't care what I see. I know what he said. All of these people did the same thing. Therefore, in verse 12, therefore sprang there even of one. Somebody say Isaac. As him, and him, or I'm sorry, Abraham. Abraham is this one. There sprang from Abraham and him as good as dead. As far as having kids goes, he was dead. As far as being a parent, forget it. You're, you're dead. You're past age. It says, him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky in multitude and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Now look at all the children of Abraham. How many are the child of Abraham today? That's because a man didn't care what it looked like when he saw his old body. I don't go by sight. I walk by what? Faith. And what's faith? It's the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. I'm not going by what I see. You did that when you got saved. Now you know what we need to do? We need to keep doing that after we're saved. With any problems we face. Oh, I see this bill. Or I see this doctor's report. Or I, I'm not walking by sight. God said he can bless. He said he can heal. I'm going by what he said. In fact, I'm going by it so much, I'm going to do something about it. And, and I think, Wilford, you've done this, and I know Christians have done this. They looked at their doctors and said, God's going to heal. And the doctor said, it's impossible. God is going to heal. I mean, for you to work up yourself to even say that to a doctor, you have just done something physically about what you never even saw. Just like Noah, he physically built an ark when he was warned of something you couldn't even see. How many know faith without what? Works is dead. What are those works? It's physically doing something or saying something or changing your life based on what you believe. If you don't really change anything, if you say you believe something and it never changes anything you're doing, you don't have faith. You have dead faith. Living faith. 
will do something about what you believe. Praise God. And so if you're discouraged about yourself, and then you believe God gave me his righteousness, it doesn't matter how unworthy I am. God gave me his righteousness. And you know how you walk by faith after that? Well, I'm not going to be discouraged about myself anymore. I'm not going to be down on myself. Why should I be down? God gave me his righteousness and I believe it. You see, if you really believe that, you wouldn't get discouraged with yourself. How many know God gave you his righteousness? Praise God. So you know what you're doing? You're walking by faith. That's why in Romans 6, when it says, we died with Jesus, we were baptized into his death when we got baptized. And we say, I'm dead with Christ. And you, you believe it so much, you tell people, my old life was gone the day I got saved. I'm a new person now. And, and you know what? You might look at me as, I don't know this, or I'm not this good, or I'm not that good. I don't think that way. I used to think that way before, but I don't anymore, because I believe that so much that I look at myself as a king and a priest now. Because God gave me his own righteousness. And some pre people going to church never even heard that before. They think you're crazy. And here it's been the Bible, same Bible they take to church with them every week. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? That's what's crazy. It's not us. <laughs> and so, verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Now you said, well, Mike, you just said they haven't seen them. Well, and then it says now they've seen them afar off. Yeah, but you got to know what that means. That means it was afar off in time. They couldn't see them then. They just saw, they knew it was going to come one day. So we do see some of these things, but we see it by faith. Now you don't go driving by faith and not by sight when you get in your car, do you? I'm going to drive by faith and not by sight. <laughs> Close my eyes all the way. That'll kill you. But when it comes to the things of God, that's kind of the way it is. You don't see it, but you believe it. It's like I see it afar off. It's there, it's not here yet. And was persuaded of them and embraced them. I mean, you believed it so much, you're convinced of it. You're, how, how many here are convinced you're righteous? You're persuaded that you are. And you're so persuaded that you confess it. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. I told people, I am saved. I've got eternal life. I believed it so much, I said something to people about it. That's why I'm doing this. My whole career is based on something I've never even seen before. Can you imagine a guy getting a job in a career and he never even seen his boss, never seen the building, never seen one single paycheck or anything like that? Yep, I'm working for this guy. <laughs> well, that's the way it is for preachers. <laughs> and uh, so go to verse 17 now. By faith... Abraham, when he was tried, how many know that means he's tested? He offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, how many know that meant he's going to kill him? Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, can you imagine? He had enough faith to have a kid when he was too old to have one. So you know what? If a guy can believe God like that and have a kid, I don't think he's even worried about taking the only son God ever gave him, said, through that boy, you're going to be the father of many nations, now kill him. That wasn't hard for Abraham. If he could believe God when his body couldn't father a child, for him to father a child and then see the boy, he, he wasn't worried at all about God asking him to kill the boy because for, God's just going to have to raise the kid up from the dead because he said, he said, I don't go by the knife plunged in his chest. I don't go by the blood pouring out of him. I don't go by his mouth not breathing anymore. I go by what God said. And he said, this boy is going to be my means of being a father of many nations. So I'm not the least bit doubtful that God will raise him up from the dead if he has to. And that's why it says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. In other words, when God said, okay, stop, here's Isaac, you can have him back. You believe, 
You don't, I didn't want you to kill him. I was testing your faith. In, in Abraham's mind, in a figure, he did come back from the dead as far as Abraham was concerned. Abraham was convinced he's going to die. So when that boy didn't have to die, in a figure, he actually received him from the dead. <laughs> By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. He didn't bless them about things they could see right there. Here's the, see this big mansion, boys? You're going to inherit this big house when I'm gone. He blessed them about things that didn't even come yet. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. You know, that always blessed me to read the leaning on the part of the top of the staff part. You know why? How many know why he had a staff? Why did he ever have to use a staff when he walked? Remember he fought with the angel that day? And remember he said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And then the angel reached down and touched his thigh and it shrank his muscle right there. And to this day, <laughs> the Jews won't eat meat from that part of an animal. And he lived the rest of his life. And that's when God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. With power with God, he said, you've got power with God, Prince of God. Israel shall be your name. And that changed the way he walked. And you know what the walk represents? It's your lifestyle. When you grab a hold of God and say, God, I'm believing you for your promises. I won't let you go. You're going to walk different for the rest of your life. And that cane, that staff represents that change that happened. And while he was leaning on that staff that he had to use ever since the day God changed his name and changed his life when he held on to God, he was prophesying to those boys. Wow, what a noble, noble picture. A man leaning on the staff that represents the change in his walk. And he's prophesying. And by faith, Joseph, when he died, how many know when he died he was in Egypt? Made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. You're going to get out of here one day, people. I see, I don't see it now. I'm living in luxury. But God told me he's going to take Israel away from here and bring you back to the land where me, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather Abraham lived. And God gave it, or my father rather, and my grandfather, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I believe it so much, I want you to do this. And he gave commandment concerning his bones. You take my bones and you pack them. I mean, you wouldn't be talking like that when you're dying if you didn't believe it was really going to happen. But he didn't even see it. But he believed it so much, he told them stuff about it and acted. He did something about it. And so, folks, when we believe the word of God, we might have said we can't stand ourselves. We might have said this, we're this, and we're that. Every time we look in the mirror. But when we believe, wait a minute, that preacher just showed me what God said. God said he gave me his righteousness. God said, I can't see it. This is what I see. I see the same face in the mirror I've, ever, I've always seen. But now I believe something different about what I, what's in that mirror. That's righteousness. That's holiness. That's God's work. And I'm not going to criticize the handiwork of God. And you believe God's word so much, you change the way you think. You change the way you talk about yourself. Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Somebody say, that's walking by faith. Go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 now. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 7, For we walk by faith, not by sight. So if you want to know what it is to be led by the Spirit or to walk after the Spirit, it's walking by faith, not by what you see. And in Romans 8 and 5, we're going to read Romans 8, verse 5 to 7. Here's the difference between a huios, a mature child of God, and somebody that's just a Christian and going to church and very weak. Romans 8 and 5. For they that are after the flesh. You want to know what they are? These are the people that do mind the things of the flesh. Their mind is on that stuff. But they that are after the Spirit, 
they do mind the things of the Spirit. Now, what chapter of Romans is this? Eight. What did chapter six say? I was baptized into Jesus' death. When you think like that, I was, I didn't see it. Nobody showed me any photographs. They didn't show me hanging up there on the cross with him. But I believe it. And I think that way about myself. You're minding the things of the Spirit. That's why he said this in chapter 8 after he wrote chapter 6 and chapter 7. You got to know what he's talking about. He's talking about things you haven't seen, but you believe it. Things that changed you. That God knew you were absolutely a new creature when he saved you. Your old way, he buried it in a grave in Jesus' tomb 2,000 years ago as far as God's concerned. And now you're a completely different person. Your whole history has been wiped clean. You're, all the things you did were forgotten by God. How many know God just doesn't forgive? He forgets. And you believe God forgot all of those sins I ever did. Some things bother Christians for years. And here all the time God's forgotten all about them. And when they stand before God, God's not even going to mention those things. And here they were letting those things bother them. That stuff was buried. So when you think like that, how many know as a man thinketh in his heart? So is he. You're going to be victorious. You are minding the things of the Spirit. For to be kindly minded is death. In other words, if you don't think of that, what Romans 6 says about being dead with Jesus, being free from sin, you think the way the rest of the world thinks, that's death. That's why your Christianity gets killed all the time. That's why Paul says, I died when the commandment came. I'm trying my best, I'm trying my best, I'm trying, but I'm being killed, I'm being killed. My Christianity is being wiped out every time I try. The harder I try, the worse I am. But that's the whole, you're not thinking right. That's why Paul said in Romans 6, know ye not, know ye not, Paul, why are you saying know ye not about three or four times in Romans 6? Because by the time I get with you to chapter 8, I'm going to tell you you need to be thinking. You need to be minding this. So i got to get it in your head first. You first got to know it. So now you can start thinking that way and minding the things of the Spirit. The things I just told you, they're the things of the Spirit. You can't see them. And when you can think about those things and act upon them and live like they're true and treat yourself the way that says you should if you're not a bad person you're the righteousness of God then you shall live you won't be destroyed with these things right the spirit will mortify these things in your body it'll kill them out somebody say it all starts with how you think be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. mind. Everybody say mind. Say it again. Mind. You're transformed. It's totally changing you by the way you think. If you really believe that you died with Jesus and you're freed from sin and you're alive to God now, you're resurrected from the dead, if you really believe that, you will never be down on yourself again. You will never be discouraged with yourself. You believe that so much, you mind the things of the Spirit, and that's how the Spirit's able to quicken your mortal body. Praise God. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now you really know what that means. Wow, I've got peace now. I used to be tormented by how down I was in myself and down on what happened in my life and down on my circumstances. And it's a battle and it was struggling and killing me. But now I've got peace. Because when I think what goes on in here that none of you see is I'm dead with Christ. He gave me his righteousness. He forgot all those things before I got saved that I ever did. And by the way, if I did do anything after I got saved and asked him to forgive me, he forgot that too. So that stuff hangs over my head no more because I mind the things that I read in chapter 6. And when I present myself to God, I come to him like somebody who knows they're alive from the dead. You Christians that don't know the Bible, when you present yourself to God, you can hardly even do it 
because you think you're no good. Who are you to come before the throne of God? Who do you think you are? And that's the way you feel God looks at you. But he says, I don't think the way you do. You think after the flesh. You mind the things of the flesh and you're going to die. But I believe what Paul said. I believe that I died with Jesus and that I'm alive from the dead. So when I go before God, every time I pray, I go like somebody alive from the dead. And God says, oh, you got it, do you? Yes, I do, Father. I finally got it. I used to be so wrong. I used to be so depressed, so discouraged in myself. I'm no good. I'm no good. But then I realized that's got nothing to do with it. Because if you gave me your righteousness, and God nodding ahead and smiling, then I can't be anything but good. If I criticize myself, I'm criticizing your righteousness. Because you gave me your righteousness. So it's crazy for me to think I'm no good anymore. I believe what you said. And God says, my son, now just give me your members. Yes, God, here's my hands. Use them as instruments of your righteousness now. Here's my mouth. Here's my, use them as instruments of your righteousness. And God quickens your mortal body because you've just given it to him. You've given yourself first as somebody alive from the dead, number two, and your members as instruments of his righteousness. There's two things you need to give to God every day when you pray. Do this every day. Here I am, God, again. I'm alive from the dead. God says, you're starting out good now. You never used to pray like that. Well, I do now, God. And not only that, Lord, take my hands today. Take my feet. Take me. Make my body an instrument of your righteousness. And that's where Romans 6 and 13 goes together with Romans 8 and 11. If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, it'll quicken your mortal body. And it'll mortify the deeds of the body. And you'll live. Because you've just given him the members of your body. And now he's going to quicken those mortal body members. Pshew, hallelujah, God. So show Romans 6 and 13. Is it on? Tell me when it's there. Praise God. Is it there yet? Is there now? Let's read it together. Somebody start. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Stop there. See, you yield yourself first. If I died with Jesus, then I believe I'm, I'm risen with him then I'm alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now number two, here's my hands and here's my feet, here's my body. Now go to Romans 8 and 10. <coughs> Read Romans 8 and 10. Tell me when it's there. Okay, somebody start reading. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of what? How many got God's righteousness? You believe you got it? You've been learning that. Well, good. The spirit is life because of righteousness. Now what's the next verse say? I can't see it, so you've got to read it. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwelt, first of all, it said you got life, right? Actually, can you go back to verse 9 quickly? Or do you have to plug it all in? Okay, read verse 9. Be that the Spirit of Christ dwell in. Okay, stop there. Notice it's talking about you. You are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. It's talking about you, right? Notice Romans 6 and 13 says you are alive from the dead, number one. And that talks about you again here. There's the same pattern. You're alive from the dead. You are in Christ. Now verse 10 again. <clears throat> and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So first he talks about you. And then he starts talking about the body. So you got a dead body. What am I going to do now, God? My body's dead. I'm in Christ and I've got life, but what about my body? Well, the spirit's life though, right? Well, yeah. Now read verse 11. 
But if the Spirit raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, and we know he is, he that also raised from the dead shall quicken your mortal body. That body that's dead because of sin, God can quicken it. It's mortal. It's dead. Not physically. Remember Paul said, I died when I tried to do good. That means you're messing up. That messed up body of yours. He said, God can quicken it. You are in the spirit. You're alive from the dead. Now, God needs to quicken your mortal body. So put chapter 6, verse 13, together with chapter 8, verse 11. And when you give God your members as instruments, then he takes them and he quickens them. And he gives them life. And then verse 12 says, so you don't have to live after the flesh anymore. You're not a debtor to the flesh. Because you've just given your bodies to God, and now he's given them life. God can't do that unless you pray like that. So how many are going to pray now in 2015? Maybe you've already been praying like this. Father, hallowed be thy name. And I'm alive from the dead. <laughs> Let your kingdom that's in heaven come to this earth. Let your will that's in heaven be done in this earth. I'm alive from the dead. Here's my hands. Here's my mouth. Here's, quicken them. Take them. Mortify these deeds of the body because if you don't, sin is going to use them as its instruments. But you've got greater power than sin. I don't have enough willpower that beats sin. That's why when I try to do good, evil's present with me. But you do have greater power. And you're doing all of that just because God said to do it. You haven't seen one bit of proof but you're thinking that way from now on anyway. And you're going to pray like that from now on anyway. And you haven't seen one thing. You know why some Christians can't get a hold of this? They struggle so much because they walk by sight all the time. Well, I, I, I can't understand. I walk by sight. I have to see it. Take, show me a movie of me dying with Jesus and I'll do it. Never do it. Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you've saw, seen. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Because they might as well have their names right up there in Hebrews chapter 11 with the rest of them. Who, by faith, the evidence of things not seen, they turned kingdoms around. They built arcs for over 100 years worth of building. They believed things so much that when a guy was dying and it wasn't going to be for another 500 years, his people would leave. He said, pack my bones. Here's detailed information and instructions of what to do with my bones when you guys leave. Because I know you're leaving. Well, you must really believe it. You're really spending time talking. Oh, I believe. I know it. So you do this with my bones when you leave. And he never saw one bit of evidence it was ever going to happen. And when you can read Romans 6 and say, I believe that. I'm dead with Christ. I'm alive from the dead. Then you can start minding that all the time now. And you know, God gave me a prophecy. And I think I played the tape to you here one day last year, if you remember. That when the enemy comes and you're down on yourself because you think you're no good, do you think you're going to all of a sudden, well, okay, what did Pastor Bloom say? I haven't been doing this for months and weeks and days. And, what did he say? I'm alive from there. You don't have time to do that. You're going to be freaking out. <laughs> but right now, if every day you get up and make it a habit, I'm alive from the dead. I'm alive from the dead. God gave me his righteousness. I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ because Jesus gave me his righteousness. I'm not no good. I'm not a loser. I'm a king and I'm a priest. I'm alive from the dead. And you start thinking like that every day. Think. Practice it. Look in the mirror. You're the righteousness of God. He who be, had no sin became sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God. Put 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 right in your mirror. I'm the righteousness of God. And then when you get used to thinking like that every day, next time the enemy comes, you're going to be able to whip him in a moment because you've already been thinking like that for so long. Somebody say, they that are led of the Spirit... They are the sons of God. Let's all stand and let's clap and give him glory. Hallelujah. Thank you. It's the evidence of things not seen. Hallelujah. I'm not going by what I see. You did that when you got saved. Now you know what we need to do? We need to keep doing that after we're saved. With any problems we face. Oh, I see this bill. Or I see this doctor's report. Or I, I'm not walking by sight. 
God said he can bless. He said he can heal. I'm going by what he said. In fact, I'm going by it so much, I'm going to do something about it. And, and I think, Wilford, you've done this, and I know Christians have done this. They looked at their doctors and said, God's going to heal. And the doctor said, it's impossible. God is going to heal. I mean, for you to work up yourself to even say that to a doctor, you have just done something physically about what you never even saw. Just like Noah, he physically built an ark when he was warned of something you couldn't even see. How many know faith without what? Works is dead. What are those works? It's physically doing something or saying something or changing your life based on what you believe. If you don't really change anything, if you say you believe something and it never changes anything you're doing, you don't have faith. You have dead faith. Living faith will do something about what you believe. Praise God. And so if you're discouraged about yourself and then you believe God gave me his righteousness. It doesn't matter how unworthy I am. God gave me his righteousness. And you know how you walk by faith after that? Well, I'm not going to be discouraged about myself anymore. I'm not going to be down in myself. Why should I be down? God gave me his righteousness and I believe it. You see, if you really believe that, you wouldn't get discouraged with yourself. How many know God gave you his righteousness? Praise God. So you know what you're doing? You're walking by faith. That's why in Romans 6, when it says, we died with Jesus, we were baptized into his death when we got baptized. And we say, I'm dead with Christ. And you, you believe it so much, you tell people, my old life was gone the day I got saved. I'm a new person now. And, and you know what? You might look at me as, I don't know this, or I'm not this good, or I'm not that good. I don't think that way. I used to think that way before, but I don't anymore because I believe that so much that I look at myself as a king and a priest now because God gave me his own righteousness. And some pre people go to church never even heard that before. They think you're crazy. And here it's been the Bible, same Bible they take to church with them every week. <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? That's what's crazy. It's not us. <laughs> And so, verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. Now, you said, well, Mike, you just said they haven't seen them. Well, and then it says now they've seen them afar off. Yeah, but you got to know what that means. That means it was afar off in time. They couldn't see them then. They just saw, they knew it was going to come one day. So we do see some of these things, but we see it by faith. Now, you don't go driving by faith and not by sight when you get in your car, do you? I'm going to drive by faith and not by sight. <laughs> Close my eyes all the way. That will kill you. But when it comes to the things of God, that's kind of the way it is. You don't see it, but you believe it. It's like I see it afar off. It's there. It's not here yet. And was persuaded of them. And embrace them. I mean, you believed it so much, you're convinced of it. You're, how, how many here are convinced you're righteous? You're persuaded that you are. And you're so persuaded that you confess it. They confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims in the earth. I told people, I am saved. I've got eternal life. I believed it so much, I said something to people about it. That's why I'm doing this. My whole career is based on something I've never even seen before. Can you imagine a guy getting a job in a career and he never even seen his boss, never seen the building, never seen one single paycheck or anything like that? Yep, I'm working for this guy. <laughs> well, that's the way it is for preachers. <laughs> and uh, so go to verse 17 now. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, how many know that means he's tested? He offered up Isaac, and he that had received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Now, how many know that many's going to kill him? Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Now, can you imagine? He had enough faith to have a kid when he was too old to have one. 
So you know what? If a guy can believe God like that and have a kid, I don't think he's even worried about taking the only son God ever gave him, said, through that boy, you're going to be the father of many nations, now kill him. That wasn't hard for Abraham. If he could believe God when his body couldn't father a child, for him to father a child and then see the boy, he, he wasn't worried at all about God asking him to kill the boy because for God's just going to have to raise the kid up from the dead because he said, he said, I don't go by the knife plunged in his chest. I don't go by the blood pouring out of him. I don't go by his mouth not breathing anymore. I go by what God said. And he said, this boy is going to be my means of being a father of many nations. So I'm not the least bit doubtful that God will raise him up from the dead if he has to. And that's why it says, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead from whence also he received him in a figure. In other words, when God said, okay, stop, here's Isaac. You can have him back. You believe. You don't, I didn't want you to kill him. I was testing your faith. In, in Abraham's mind, in a figure, he did come back from the dead as far as Abraham was concerned. Abraham was convinced he's going to die. So when that boy didn't have to die, in a figure, he actually received him from the dead. <laughs> By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. He didn't bless them about things they could see right there. Here's the, see this big mansion, boys? You're going to inherit this big house when I'm gone. He blessed them about things that didn't even come yet. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshipped, leaning on the top of his staff. You know, that always blessed me to read the leaning on the part of the top of his staff part. You know why? How many know why he had a staff? Why did he ever have to use a staff when he walked? Remember, he fought with the angel that day? And remember, he said, I'm not letting you go until you bless me. And then the angel reached down and touched his thigh and it shrank his muscle right there. And to this day, the Jews won't eat meat from that part of an animal. And he lived the rest of his life. And that's when God changed his name from Jacob to Israel. With power with God, he said, you've got power with God, Prince of God, Israel shall be your name. And that changed the way he walked. And you know what the walk represents? It's your lifestyle. When you grab a hold of God and say, God, I'm believing you for your promises. I won't let you go. You're going to walk different for the rest of your life. And that cane, that staff represents that change that happened. And while he was leaning on that staff that he had to use ever since the day God changed his name and changed his life, when he held on to God, he was prophesying to those boys. Wow, what a noble, noble picture. A man leaning on the staff that represents the change in his walk. And he's prophesying. And by faith, Joseph, when he died, how many know when he died he was in Egypt? Made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. You're going to get out of here one day, people. I see, I don't see it now. I'm living in luxury. But God told me he's going to take Israel away from here and bring you back to the land where me, my grandfather, and my great-grandfather Abraham lived. And God gave it, or my father rather, and my grandfather, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I believe it so much, I want you to do this. And he gave commandment concerning his bones. You take my bones and you pack them. I mean, you wouldn't be talking like that when you're dying if you didn't believe it was really going to happen. But he didn't even see it. But he believed it so much, he told them stuff about it and acted. He did something about it. And so, folks, when we believe the word of God, we might have said we can't stand ourselves. We might have said this, we're this, and we're that. Every time we look in the mirror. But when we believe, wait a minute, that preacher just showed me what God said. God said he gave me his righteousness. God said, I can't see it. This is what I see. I see the same face in the mirror I've, ever, I've always seen. But now I believe something different about what I, what's in that mirror. That's righteousness. That's holiness. That's God's work. And I'm not going to criticize the handiwork of God. And you believe God's word so much, you change the way you think. You change the way you talk about yourself. 
Praise God. Isn't that awesome? Somebody say, that's walking by faith. Go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 7 now. It says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So if you want to know what it is to be led by the Spirit or to walk after the Spirit, it's walking by faith, not by what you see. And in Romans 8 and 5, we're going to read Romans 8, verse 5 to 7. Here's the difference between a huios, a mature child of God, and somebody that's just a Christian and going to church and very weak. Romans 8 and 5. For they that are after the flesh. You want to know what they are? These are the people that do mind the things of the flesh. Their mind is on that stuff. But they that are after the spirit, they do mind the things of the spirit. Now what chapter of Romans is this? Eight. What did chapter six say? I was baptized into Jesus' death. When you think like that, I was I didn't see it. Nobody showed me any photographs. They didn't show me hanging up there on the cross with him. But I believe it. And I think that way about myself. You're minding the things of the Spirit. That's why he said this in chapter 8 after he wrote chapter 6 and chapter 7. You got to know what he's talking about. He's talking about things you haven't seen, but you believe it. Things that changed you. That God knew you were absolutely a new creature when he saved you. Your old way, he buried it in a grave in Jesus' tomb 2,000 years ago as far as God's concerned. And now you're a completely different person. Your whole history has been wiped clean. You're, all the things you did were forgotten by God. How many know God just doesn't forgive? He forgets. And you believe, God forgot all of those sins I ever did. Some things bother Christians for years. And here all the time, God's forgotten all about them. And when they stand before God, God's not even going to mention those things. And here they were letting those things bother them. That stuff was buried. So when you think like that, how many know as a man thinketh in his heart? So is he. You're going to be victorious. You are minding the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. In other words, if you don't think of that, what Romans 6 says about being dead with Jesus, being free from sin, you think the way the rest of the world thinks, that's death. That's why your Christianity gets killed all the time. That's why Paul says, I died when the commandment came. I'm trying my best, I'm trying my best, I'm trying, but I'm being killed, I'm being killed. My Christianity is being wiped out every time I try. The harder I try, the worse I am. But that's the whole, you're not thinking right. That's why Paul said in Romans 6, Know ye not? Know ye not? Paul, why are you saying know ye not about three or four times in Romans 6? Because by the time I get with you to chapter 8, I'm going to tell you you need to be thinking. You need to be minding this. So i got to get it in your head first. You first got to know it. So now you can start thinking that way and minding the things of the Spirit. The things I just told you, they're the things of the Spirit. You can't see them. And when you can think about those things and act upon them and live like they're true and treat yourself the way that says you should if you're not a bad person you're the righteousness of God then you shall live you won't be destroyed with these things right the spirit will mortify these things in your body it'll kill them out somebody say it all starts with how you think be transformed by the renewing of your what? Mind. Everybody say mind. Say it again. Mind. You're transformed. It's totally changing you by the way you think. If you really believe that you died with Jesus and you're freed from sin and you're alive to God now, you're resurrected from the dead, if you really believe that, you will never be down on yourself again. You will never be discouraged with yourself. You believe that so much, you mind the things of the Spirit, and that's how the Spirit is able to quicken your mortal body. Praise God. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Now you really know what that means. Wow, I've got peace now. I used to be tormented by how down I was in myself and down on what happened in my life and down on my circumstances. And it's a battle and it was struggling and killing me. But now I've got peace. Because when I think 
what goes on in here that none of you see is I'm dead with Christ. He gave me his righteousness. He forgot all those things before I got saved that I ever did. And by the way, if I did do anything after I got saved and asked him to forgive me, he forgot that too. So that stuff hangs over my head no more because I mind the things that I read in chapter 6. And when I present myself to God, I come to him like somebody who knows they're alive from the dead. You Christians that don't know the Bible, when you present yourself to God, you can hardly even do it because you think you're no good. Who are you to come before the throne of God? Who do you think you are? And that's the way you feel God looks at you. But he says, I don't think the way you do. You think after the flesh. You mind the things of the flesh and you're going to die. But I believe what Paul said. I believe that I died with Jesus and that I'm alive from the dead. So when I go before God, every time I pray, I go like somebody alive from the dead. And God says, oh, you got it, do you? Yes, I do, Father. I finally got it. I used to be so wrong. I used to be so depressed, so discouraged in myself. I'm no good. I'm no good. But then I realized that's got nothing to do with it. Because if you gave me your righteousness, and God's nodding ahead and smiling, then I can't be anything but good. If I criticize myself, I'm criticizing your righteousness. Because you gave me your righteousness. So it's crazy for me to think I'm no good anymore. I believe what you said. And God says, my son, now just give me your members. Yes, God, here's my hands. Use them as instruments of your righteousness now. Here's my mouth. Here's my, use them as instruments of your righteousness. And God quickens your mortal body because you've just given it to him. You've given yourself first as somebody alive from the dead, number two, and your members as instruments of his righteousness. There's two things you need to give to God every day when you pray. Do this every day. Here I am, God, again. I'm alive from the dead. God says, you're starting out good now. You never used to pray like that. Well, I do now, God. And not only that, Lord, take my hands today. Take my feet. Take me. Make my body an instrument of your righteousness. And that's where Romans 6 and 13 goes together with Romans 8 and 11. If the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you, it'll quicken your mortal body. And it'll mortify the deeds of the body. And you'll live. Because you've just given him the members of your body. And now he's going to quicken those mortal body members. Pshew, hallelujah, God. So show Romans 6 and 13. Is it on? Tell me when it's there. Praise God. Is it there yet? Is there now? Let's read it together. Somebody start. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Stop there. See, you yield yourself first. If I died with Jesus, then I believe I'm, I'm risen with him then I'm alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. Now number two, here's my hands and here's my feet, here's my body. Now go to Romans 8 and 10. <coughs> Read Romans 8 and 10. Tell me when it's there. Okay, somebody start reading. The body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of what? How many got God's righteousness? You believe you got it? You've been learning that. Well, good. The spirit is life because of righteousness. Now what's the next verse say? I can't see it, so you've got to read it. But if the spirit of him that raised up Christ from the dead dwelt, first of all, it said you got life, right? Actually, can you go back to verse 9 quickly? Or do you have to plug it all in? Okay, read verse 9. The Spirit of Christ. Okay, stop there. Notice it's talking about you. You are not in the flesh, but you're in the Spirit, if the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. It's talking about you, right? Notice Romans 6 and 13 says you are alive from the dead, number one. 
Now it talks about you again here. There's the same pattern. You're alive from the dead. You are in Christ. Now verse 10 again. <coughs> and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. So first he talks about you, and then he starts talking about the body. So you got a dead body. What am I going to do now, God? My body's dead. I'm in Christ, and I've got life, but what about my body? Well, the spirit's life, though, right? Well, yeah. Now read verse 11. But if the spirit raised up Christ from the dead dwell in you, and we know he is, he that also raised from the dead shall quicken your mortal body. That body that's dead because of sin, God can quicken it. It's mortal. It's dead. Not physically. Remember Paul said, I died when I tried to do good. That means you're messing up. That messed up body of yours, he said, God can quicken it. You are in the spirit. You're alive from the dead. Now, God needs to quicken your mortal body. So put chapter 6, verse 13, together with chapter 8, verse 11. And when you give God your members as instruments, then he takes them and he quickens them. And he gives them life. And then verse 12 says, so you don't have to live after the flesh anymore. You're not a debtor to the flesh. Because you've just given your bodies to God, and now he's given them life. God can't do that unless you pray like that. So how many are going to pray now in 2015? Maybe you've already been praying like this. Father, hallowed be thy name. And I'm alive from the dead. <laughs> Let your kingdom that's in heaven come to this earth. Let your will that's in heaven be done in this earth. I'm alive from the dead. Here's my hands. Here's my mouth. Quicken them. Take them. Mortify these deeds of the body because if you don't, sin is going to use them as its instruments. But you've got greater power than sin. I don't have enough willpower that beats sin. That's why when I try to do good, evil's present with me. But you do have greater power. And you're doing all of that just because God said to do it. You haven't seen one bit of proof, but you're thinking that way from now on anyway. And you're going to pray like that from now on anyway. And you haven't seen one thing. You know why some Christians can't get a hold of this? They struggle so much because they walk by sight all the time. Well, I, I, I can't understand. I walk by sight. I have to see it. Take, show me a movie of me dying with Jesus and I'll do it. Never do it. Jesus said, Thomas, you believe because you've saw, seen. But blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Because they might as well have their names right up there in Hebrews chapter 11 with the rest of them. Who, by faith, the evidence of things not seen, they turned kingdoms around. They built arcs for over 100 years worth of building. They believed things so much that when a guy was dying and it wasn't going to be for another 500 years, his people would leave. He said, pack my bones. Here's detailed information and instructions of what to do with my bones when you guys leave because I know you're leaving. Well, you must really believe it. You're really spending time talking. Oh, I believe I know it. So you do this with my bones when you leave. And he never saw one bit of evidence it was ever going to happen. And when you can read Romans 6 and say, I believe that. I'm dead with Christ. I'm alive from the dead. Then you can start minding that all the time now. And you know, God gave me a prophecy. And I think I played the tape to you here one day last year, if you remember. That when the enemy comes and you're down on yourself because you think you're no good, do you think you're going to all of a sudden, well, okay, what did Pastor Bloom say? I haven't been doing this for months and weeks and days. And, what did he say? I'm alive from there. You don't have time to do that. You're going to be freaking out. <laughs> but right now, if every day you get up and make it a habit, I'm alive from the dead. I'm alive from the dead. God gave me his righteousness. I'm as righteous as Jesus Christ because Jesus gave me his righteousness. I'm not no good. I'm not a loser. I'm a king and I'm a priest. I'm alive from the dead. And you start thinking like that every day. Think, practice it. Look in the mirror. You're the righteousness of God. He who be, had no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Put 2 Corinthians 5 and 21 right in your mirror. I'm the righteousness of God. And then when you get used to thinking like that every day, next time the enemy comes, you're going to be able to whip him in a moment because you've already been thinking like that for so long. 
Somebody say, they that are led of the Spirit, they are the sons of God. Let's all stand and let's clap and give him glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, 2015 is just not automatically going to be anything for us. If we just sit back, 2015 might have this terrorist thing happen or that happen, and maybe that's why it's been happening in years, because your people weren't doing the if. But we understand the if-then principle. If we humble ourselves, if we seek your face, if we turn from our wicked ways, then you will heal the land. Then you will raise it up. And so, God, I'm doing the if. I'm going to do my part. Somebody say, my part is the if. Yes. If you draw nigh unto me, then I'll draw nigh unto you. If you will turn from your way, then I will heal the land. God, and especially in this land, you need to heal this land. This land that you made from the dust of the ground, it needs healing, God. And it might be sickness, and it might be spiritual. Because if you've got a hard problem with your heart spiritually and you do evil things or think evil, your land needs healing. So if you'll believe with the word and do your part, then God will heal the land. Hallelujah, God. And so, Father, in the name of Jesus, we know and we reckon ourselves to be dead into sin and alive unto God, and we yield ourselves. Somebody say, no, reckon and yield. No reckon and yield. And next time we get together, Lord willing, I want to talk about those walls of Jericho again. Because you need to be able to look at the thing that scared you before. Like those walls scared Israel. And you need to walk around them and keep looking at them and not say one thing of complaint. Not one word of fear. And when God tells you to speak, then you speak. And you're going to shout when you speak. And those things that scared you for years are going to fall. Isn't it funny he made them walk around things that scared them? That's why they couldn't go in land, those walls. Well, you need to look what you're afraid of right in the face and not say one word because that's where you went wrong before. <clears throat> How many believe the walls are coming down? Hallelujah. Let's clap again. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I rebuke every spirit of intimidation over anybody's life right now. I rebuke every spirit of sickness. I rebuke every spirit of condemnation and self-hate. I rebuke every spirit of fear. I rebuke spirits even of pride. In Jesus' name, all of that, I bind your powers over the people of God. And Father, we pray your revelation hit us all. A spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you. That we overcome all these obstacles. We tear down all these walls in the name of Jesus that will rise up against us in this year. And we will march around them. We will look at them. We will not complain. And we will see them go down with a shout. In Jesus Christ's name. Somebody say amen. Amen. amen, amen, hallelujah. Let's thank him again. Praise God, praise God. Wilfred, can you close for us in prayer? Let's pray with him. Hallelujah, God. Lord, we just give you all the honor and the glory for a new year again here. Yes. We just thank you for what you've done in our lives. We thank you for the minister we have here. We thank you Jesus for Jesus come. And let us have a fresh start here and as we go and move to the other place, Lord, be with us. Yes. Come and join us there, Lord. Jesus' name. We just ask for a good afternoon and be with us and guide and direct us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's believe God for many souls to come as we take this step of faith. We're taking the step of faith. So see you next week at the hall. Yes. Greet each other in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. I'm going to get some of the books if anyone wants to buy any and uh, try to get some on hand if you need to get them. There's that sinless that we're teaching from. <laughs> so. well, good to see you, man. That's right. I haven't seen you for since last year. <laughs> Driving by.